Hello my dear students, welcome back. Let us continue the topic, the processes in our DNA technology. We have already discussed some steps. Before moving to the new steps, let me revise the steps we have already discussed. The first step, isolation of DNA. The second, fragmentation of the isolated DNA. Then the third step, separation of these fragments in jelly electrophoresis. And the fourth step, ligation of the desired DNA. Isolation of the desired DNA and its ligation to the vector to produce RDNA. Then transfer of the RDNA to the host cell. So we have already discussed how is a host cell made competent to receive the RDNA. Still, once again, listen to the point. How is a host cell made competent to receive RDNA? In order to transfer the RDNA to the host cell, host cell is treated with divalent cations, then ice incubation, ice technique in bacterial cells, okay, divalent cation treatment, then ice heat shock ice, okay, incubation, and if it's a plant cell, what is using gene gun method, okay, biolistics, the RDNA coated on microparticles of tungsten and gold are bombarded to the host cell, plant cell. And if it's an animal cell, it is the, with the help of micro injection, directly injected to the animal cell. Okay, so using these all techniques, we can deliver the RDNA to uh, typical host cells. Okay, hmm? then. The next case, if it is delivered, I mean if the host cells now received the RDNA means, we have many techniques to select them. We have discussed what, I mean antibiotic resistance we can take as a selection technique. Otherwise, uh, enzyme sequence, beta galactosidase enzyme sequence as the selectable marker. By using many of the techniques, we can uh, identify the transformants and we can identify the recombinants. Only the recombinants we select and we have to grow them in large scale or small scale according to our need. Okay, so then large scale culturing of the host cell is our next step. So transfer of the RDNA to the host by, by making host cell competent by various methods like Incubation, then micro injection, biolistics. Okay, here. Already I think we have discussed in detail. Hmm? Then here, in the large scale culture of the host cell, okay, suppose bacterial cells, in order to grow them, why, why we need to grow them? Okay, our aim is, actually our aim is to produce recombinant protein. Suppose the RDNA contain insulin gene. Okay, then our aim is to produce insulin. The insulin is the recombinant protein there. What is meant by a recombinant protein? Hmm? So, in this particular technique, our aim is, RDNA technology aims to produce recombinant protein. What do you mean by a recombinant protein? A protein which is expressed in a heterologous host. If an organism is producing a protein, not its own. Okay, a protein which is produced in a heterologous host because of the expression of a foreign gene. If I produce a protein due to the insertion of a foreign gene, then that protein is called a recombinant protein. When a bacterium produces insulin due to the presence of insulin gene in the form of our DNA, it is then a recombinant protein for the bacterium. So, a recombinant protein is defined as a protein expressed in a heterologous host. What is the reason? Due to the insertion of a foreign gene. Okay. So, our aim of this technique, the full technique steps is what? To produce a recombinant protein. How is this done? So, if it is the back, most commonly we use bacteria as the host cell. Suppose we have used, inserted the RDNA in bacteria. What is the method to isolate the recombinant protein? 
culture the bacteria in culture plate okay culture the bacteria or grow the bacteria in a medium this culture is possible as simple culture technique we can simply culture the bacterium or grow the bacterium in a small petri dish or in a test tube in simple culture medium we can grow them and where the other very common method is continuous culture we can grow the bacterium in continuous culture what do you mean by a continuous culture hmm? in a continuous culture we are growing bacterium in a medium where we are ensuring the continuous supply of fresh nutrients okay throughout the growing period the bacteria are in log phase logarithmic phase exponential phase there is no any shortage or demand for the uh, nutrients always we supply fresh nutrients to one end and we remove the waste or the used up medium to the other end if we maintain a continuous system like this that is called a continuous culture system so most commonly the bacteria the host cells are i mean the transformed host cells are grown in a culture medium which is provided continuous supply of nutrients and the removal of used nutrients the waste okay this is known as continuous culture the advantage is every time the bacteria are in exponential growth phase logarithmic growth phase continuous growth also this is known as a continuous culture most commonly continuous culture is used other than simple culture techniques okay then suppose we need the large scale production of the recombinant protein we don't rely on the simple continuous technique continuous culture techniques we have the large devices known as bioreactors that is what our next top section is large scale culturing of the host cells is done in bioreactors listen to the point so how is the large scale growth of bacteria carried out it is by using bioreactors what are bioreactors bioreactors are the large containers which can accommodate about thousands of liters of culture volumes okay bioreactors are the large containers where the sample the culture i mean the host cells can biologically gives rise to the products okay about thousand liters of volume it can accommodate and here from the medium we can culture the cells and directly biologically this can be uh, expressed also the genes can be expressed to give the products we don't get number of bacteria instead uh, we get the products as such from the uh, bioreactors that is the advancement in bioreactors the raw materials can be the raw materials include the culture growth the medium along with the cells host cells the raw materials can be biologically converted to the products we get the products from the bioreactors that is the advantage of bioreactors let us discuss the two types of bioreactors which come under the same category stirred tank bioreactor the most common type of bioreactor used nowadays is stirred tank bioreactor from the word you can get the idea there is a stirring always done stirring mixing is always done in a stirred tank bioreactor there are two common types simple stirred tank bioreactor and sparge stirred tank bioreactor so keep in mind the two types of bioreactors i mean the common type of bioreactor is stirred tank bioreactor it is of two major types simple stirred tank sparge stirred tank if is any case in both the cases there are some fundamental requirements all these bioreactors should have certain characteristics the first and most important thing there should be an agitator system there should be an agitator system a stirring system there should be an oxygen delivery system okay oxygen delivery system then there should be temperature control system 
there should be a temperature control device there should be ph control setup ph control setup and there must be a foam breaker this is a fully dealing with nutrients and there may be forms of the nutrients after stirring and usually what is preferred is a foam breaker also and there must contain sampling pots through which we can take the new i mean the culture cells outside and check the status anyway what are the primary requisites or the primary parts of a bioreactor whether it's any of the types whether it's the simple steel the tank or a sparse steel the tank a bioreactor must carry these components it should contain an agitator system a stirrer device it should contain an oxygen delivery system and it should contain a temperature control system ph control system a foam breaker and sampling pots then agitator system or oxygen delivery system when we provide or okay, when we supply oxygen and or the nutrients the agitator system ensure that this is homogeneously supplied throughout the culture vessel the agitator system in simple tank in this type is a impeller rotation of the impellers it works like a fan with the help of the motor this flat bladed impellers rotate i have seen the shown the direction when the flat bladed impellers rotate in a particular rpm rotation per minute this is mixing the nutrients here i mean the nutrients present in the in the culture broth with the culture broth or nutrients okay and the oxygen available in the chamber will be uniformly mixed by the action of the stirrer flat bladed impellers okay so the here in the first type agitation or the stirring is with the help of flat bladed impellers uh, moving rotation okay then unlike this in the sparge tank bioreactor in the sparge type you can just see there is no any impellers or blades uh, working here there is no such rotations here here by the forceful sparging of air bubbles that's why the name sparged okay air bubbles are sparged into this chamber with the help of a device air bubbles are sparged into the chamber so that is continuously shaken it's shaken and there is uniform mixing of the oxygen and uh, nutrients so this is the second type sparge steel tank bioreactor air bubbles are sparged so that throughout the medium there is homogeneous supply of nutrients and air okay then set next this to a clear i think the agitator only help the uniform supply of oxygen also oxygen and nutrients there is no any settling of the nutrients to the bottom homogeneous supply is maintained uniformly then there is a temperature control system through this temperature control system we can maintain the optimal temperature for the action of the uh, i mean expression of these cells and also the ph ph also we can regulate okay after the accumulation of the waste products and all the ph change continuously we can see the ph change and we can control through an out inlet similar to the foam breaker system and when the foam is produced at the top it can be broken by some other devices some other techniques and some other components then sampling ports we have it's not marked here some sample sampling ports are there where we can open and take the culture out culture broth out and check the status whether it has produced the protein or not whether the bacteria are in the culture growth stage or not everything we can check through the sampling ports okay this is the details about the bioreactor that is about the large scale culturing of the host cell it is done in a large volume containers known as bioreactors okay mm? and it is similar way the fermenter works in the fermentation you know the beverage industry the beverage industry you have seen pictures of large breweries with a very large tanks the similar working mechanism is there in order to produce uh, alcohol fermenters okay so let us move on to the last step extraction of the desired product how we extract the desired product from the stand okay so the last step in rdna technology 
This is not in detail, it's in very brief. It is the downstream processing. So our products are now present in the bioreactors, the large volume chambers and we have to separate them by suitable method. We can extract it out, okay, separation from the bioreactor, the product separation, its purification. It will be along with the culture broth, its purification. Then if it's a medicine or which require a clinical trial, the clinical trials should be followed and if any of the products for our use, it should be quality checked. Okay, and these three steps collectively known as downstream processing. After downstream processing only, the product is marketed. So, the downstream processing include the separation, purification and clinical trials or quality check of the recombinant protein. Okay, the desired protein or the recombinant protein is separated, purified and tested okay before marketed. Okay, and with this topic, this chapter, biotechnology principles and processes is over and it's uh, doubt clearance we will do in the live session. Thank you. See you in the live session.